So could you introduce yourselves and your property please? Cool, yes, well I'm Kylie from Mountain Road Estate and this is Dan and we've been living here for six years now um, here on, in Normanby. Um, we have three acres where we have three main crops at the moment. We've got white sage, lavender and truffles as well as truffle inoculated trees and eventually hazelnuts as well. Um, so our main goal is to create a highly productive three acres where we can offer awesome high quality products to our community. So what have we got here Kylie? So this is our main white sage crop. Uh, white sage is a highly sacred plant and a lot of people use it in their spiritual practices. It also has a lot of antifungi properties so it's actually a really great medicinal um, tool for many people dealing with fungus and on their skin. Um, and so it is actually um, from, from California, uh, which means it's a desert plant, so it really requ requires a lot of uh, sandy soil. And luckily enough here we have such free draining soil that it does quite well. Um, it likes a lot of sunshine hours and even though we do get a lot of wind here in Hawada, it grows quite well with the beautiful sunshine that it does get. Um, they can often grow quite high, a lot taller than me. However, I've been pruning them low because with those winds, um, they get more protection from the harakiki on the left, on my left here um, to prevent them from getting blown over. Uh, so we will distill this as well as cut it and um, dry it in bunches um, and then I sell them as dried bunches but also dried leaves. It is. So this is where we've planted some of our favourite herbs. We've got a lot of evening primrose growing here as well as rose geranium some more white sage, uh, some lovely straw flowers, different types of salvia. Um, I also have some beehives here on the site so um, we like to make sure that we've got a lot of plant, uh, like plants for the bees to take the nectar from. Um, over here we have um, five different types of lavender and that's a really wonderful thing to watch um, in the spring early summer because the different lavenders bloom and flower at different times so um, we get to watch different flowers bloom at different times, which is really beautiful. And we will cut the, the flowers for dried bunches. My name is Benny and I'm standing in front of some lavender. And we've got some oak trees um, as well. Um, we hoe the, um, we hoe it. What does that mean? Um, we get like this. Um, this thing just like... And then we like break all the dirt up and stuff and it gets all the grass and stuff out of it. And yeah, I help picking the lavender and stuff. And it's pretty fun actually. What? I like doing that. It like takes up lots of time and stuff, but um, like when I'm bored, I um, yeah, sometimes I get bored and then because Mum's throwing the lavender and I come out and help her hold it as well. What do you do with it? What after you've picked it? Um, we distill it in a um, still, and we make oil and hide stuff out of it. And and we've got the old trees and lots of other trees to um, grow truffles because we're going to grow truffles. What are truffles? Um, truffles are a type of food that um, like... Does it grow on the trees? No. It, Where um, does it grow? It grows on the ground oh. in, the roots and, in the roots and stuff. Can you explain to us what we've got here please, Dan? So out here we have uh, Quercus ilex, which is a holm oak, so it's an evergreen oak, and these ones have the greener leaves, uh, Corvius aviana, or hazelnuts. Uh, the reason I chose these two trees is because they're both ectomycorrhizal, and uh, we used tuber melanosporum, which is perigord black truffle, it's also ectomycorrhizal, uh, and when these trees were grown, uh, in seedling stage we inoculated them with the, the truffle uh, which has infected the root tips and what happens is it causes uh, a dense hyphal sheath or a mantle to form around the root tips and from that uh, mantle uh, microscopic filaments of hyphae grow out through the soil uh, to 
absorb the micronutrients that the trees themselves couldn't uh, couldn't absorb, and then it feeds it back into the the, the roots of the tree to help. Uh, carry out photosynthesis and bits and pieces and then the tree will feed the sugars back down to the fungi uh, and so it's a bit of a win-win situation for both uh, and on that um, microscopic filaments of hyphae uh, a trufet or a truffle will form in December uh, and with the heavy rains that we get over summer uh, eventually grow um, and it has about the same mass or density as a potato and then the frosts and winter will help set that truffle and ripen it, uh, give it the aromas and the flavour that uh, is so sought after and we'll be able to come around with a dog and uh, trained dog and sniff out the truffle and, and dig them out and then we have about a, a week shelf life uh, to get it to the market. So it sounds like there's a lot of cooperation going on there between the plants and the mycorrhizal fungi and th there could well be as much going on underground as above the ground. Can you explain a bit about what's, what's going on down there under your feet? So with what's happening, different trees can be infected with different kind of mycorrhizal fungi. Uh, these ones specifically have been chosen as well as all our shelterbouts to not be competitive with the truffle fungi, you know, the desired fungi that we want. Uh, we have um, adjusted the soil conditions uh, in the last six years to increase the pH into a range that's favorable for fruiting of the truffle species that we're after, which also helps because it uh, puts it outside of a range of, of the, the sort of competing fungi that we don't want here as well. So we are more, more targeted to what we're after. We have in the two acres at the front here added 75 tons of lime uh, to increase up uh, our pH up to around eight, eight and a half percent, which is good for uh, fruiting of this species of truffle. Um, the plants and the truffle can survive in around pH of seven, uh, but so can everything else. So we try to get the upper range into the fruiting window. Uh, we also couldn't put all that lime on all at once because you have issues with dumping and, and leaching and, and uh, buffering out. Uh, and all that sort of stuff so we we did an initial deep rip and 35 tons uh, and then disked it all in um, and then every year since then I apply 10 tons in a tow behind spreader on a quad bike to reduce soil compaction because we want a free aerated uh, you know draining soil um, and I also have like a spike aerator attachment that I can tow around and poke holes through the, the grass just to help wash that lime in it, uh, when we apply it um, also, applying that much lime uh, in such a heavy quantity can cause issues with uh, feeding stock and everything. Uh, and it also changes different trace elements. Uh, we haven't been able to graze this property while we've been doing the soil adjustments, but we do uh, frequently mow. Um, and the, the target or the aim of that is to mow and capture the grass um, and re remove it from site uh, because we are trying to grow out the phosphorus levels um, because adjusting anything you kind of can't just change one specific thing uh, so we've been mowing and capturing the grass um, to reduce that and keep it in a good range but we also are spray free and organic so we're trying to promote like a healthy living organic soil um, So here we want a real good living soil. Um, you can see it's it's really aerated and, and friable or break apart. We have about a 47% sand content and only 12% clay. So we're um, and we don't have any close clay shelf or anything. Um, we can break the soil apart and in here. Loads of worms, lots of roots going all different depths because we don't have one specific kind of grass. Um, and you can also see the little parts of, of the lime um, that we've applied in the, in the white flecks and the different, different parts of it. There's 
This looks like a wicked machine. What do you use this for? Yeah, so this is the table home cultivator that I built. Uh, at the moment, I've got the spike aerator on it. So this uh, just spins around and pokes holes in the ground uh, through the grass and helps drainage. We get about 50, 50 to 75 mil deep. Um, I load it up with a bit of weight in this basket here. Um, I can also put S tines on it and uh, deep rip through the roots and things for the truffle, but we won't need to do that until the trees are a little bit bigger. And, and usually I have a, a winch on the front, so then I can just adjust the, the different heights with the, with the arm. So we've seen your lovely soil. What have we got here? Dan? So this is a maize paddock and they crop silage as well uh, in a no-till uh, setup. And we'll dig a hole and see if we can do the same kind of thing. Not really, I was going to put it in there. But in comparison. See if you can find a worm, Benny. So how does it, how different does it feel? <laughs> it's it's it very really hard. hard. Yeah. I can't see anything Marshall? living in there. There's a couple of roots from the from the maze maybe. Oh look. Finally one. Teeny tiny though. Found one. So living in South Taranaki, one of the issues we have to contend with is the wind. Uh, and obviously the way we wanted to do that was as as kind to the environment as we could. Uh, we, we opted for growing our wind shelter plants. Um, part of our plan was uh, not only to stop the wind but to use trees and um, bits and pieces that had flowering or fruiting um, for birds and bees um, and contribute to to you know our environment as well as as stopping the wind. Uh, we have a row of flax, a row of cryptomeria japonica and then a row of natives so I've used about six meters for our, our wind breaks um, and these ones are about five years old which we're doing pretty good about about four or five meters tall at, at the moment uh, and and stop quite a lot of the wind we wouldn't have anywhere near the success with growing the rest of our trees without uh, being able to stop the wind uh, so the first part of the project here when we were getting on top of everything was to put put the trees in here so in this greenhouse we're raising uh, hazels on this side and oak on this side uh, grow the seed in vermiculite or perlite and you know uh, in a volcanic substrate that won't have any competitive fungi. When the seedlings grow a little bit bigger, I'll um, probably only use about 10%. We'll uh, avoid any J-rooted or funny trees, use only the strong ones, and that's what I'll inoculate with the truffle um, into another sterile medium. So we, we raise a lot more than we need. Yep, and so part of that is also uh, buying the truffle and getting it DNA tested and then uh, using the microscopes and everything to confirm spore counts and bits and pieces as well. A few different bits and pieces in here, medicinal herbs, but um, over here we have the next stage of inoculated trees. So once they've grown a little bit bigger in the seeds, we'll um, end up inoculating them and putting them in these slightly larger tubes with a, a different media made up um, and then let the the uh, fungi grow and infect the root tips um, and be free of other competitive uh, fungi. This is beast. And so this is a wood chipper slash vacuum. Uh, I can tow this around behind my lawnmower and we have an attachment on here that connects to the deck and it helps suck the grass clippings out into the trailer. Um, we'll also use it because hazels are deciduous so they'll lose all the leaves and uh, we'll pick up all the leaf matter and the nuts and bits and pieces up with this. Just tip it out the back when we're done. What's the windmill for Dan? So part of growing trees obviously is being able to water them if we have uh, dry spells. So we've got our well drilled. Uh, we hit water about six meters and went down um, just past ten just to make sure we had access to it through all times of the year. Then we have this old Ferguson windmill with a leather cup and piston pump on it. Uh, and from here we pump it out to a, a water tower to get better head pressure um, to fill up the, the tanks to water the trees when we need to. Um, it's it's ma you know, made it a lot more comforting knowing that we do have access to water if we need it.
And so here we have a copper alembic column still. This one was actually handmade in Portugal. Uh, we use this for distilling uh, different botanicals. Uh, put, uh, it's, it's got a couple of different ways you can run it. Um, with the column set up, you can put the plant material in the, in the column, uh, water in the bowl, and we have gas to heat the water. And as the steam rises up through the plant material, it carries the volatile organic compounds up through the onion and the dome into the condenser bucket where there's a coil in here. And we keep the bucket cold with uh, circulating condenser water. Um, and the distillate turns back into a liquid and then the hydrosol separates from the essential oil. Uh, it takes a lot of plant material to make a small amount of essential oil. So uh, depending on what botanical you're using, they're all different. Um, the, the hydrosol will come out the bottom and the, the essential oil goes out the top. Uh, we distill other products uh, by putting the plant material and the water straight in the bowl and removing the column in this section of the condenser and then it's more like making a cup of tea uh, and so the hydrosol has different aspects of the plant um, and it's used for different things. So for a rosemary I might distill it as a hydrosol and the lavender, I distill it as an essential oil, and then we mix the two together and make uh, a free spirit mist or a hairspray for a... I see you've got something special there. Can you tell us a bit about it, please? Yeah. I did distill this for my hair so it didn't get knots in it. Do you know what's in it? Rosemary. Well, and? And lavender. Can you tell us a bit about how and where you sell your products, Kylie? Sure thing. Well, I guess you would say our market is split in two. So we have like the retail side of things where we sell directly to the customer. That's probably one of our favourite um, aspects of it because we get to actually hear how it's impacting the customer. And also um, we get to just learn why they're buying it and how they feel after they've used it. And so they can buy straight from our website, um, but also we go to local markets as well. Um, and then we have the other side of our business, which is like um, wholesale. So uh, we appear in quite a few different stores around New Zealand. Uh, so uh, Brandy's Botanicals down the road in Ohawi, Remedy in, um, in Stratford, uh, Down to Earth Organics in New Plymouth, um, and then a few other places dotted around the Waikato, Auckland, and down south. What would you like to say to people who would like to get into some sort of land use? Well, I guess um, from my point of view, I grew up in town on a small like house in a, in a small town and that was fine and I had a good time. But what I have noticed the difference within myself is living alongside nature, understanding how the weather impacts the land, the natural cycles and how you can mirror that with the way that you live your life, it really brings a beautiful way into living. Um, I think that there's so many, so many lessons that we can learn from nature and often our everyday busy life pulls us away from those lessons. And when part of your work, part of your work day is, um, is involving yourself in nature and understanding those processes and how they impact you and your business, it really brings a more rounded life um, to yourself. But also, it's not easy work either. Um, I wouldn't say that it's all running in the lavender fields, um, but I would say that even on the rainiest days, I feel like I've contributed not only to my family, but to the land that I live on, and that feels good. So from my point of view and my perspective on what got us here, um, I used to be doing 60 or 80 hours a week uh, in engineering um, in, up in the Waikato. Uh, we had two young children with a lot of issues for colic and reflux um, and it was difficult being away uh, so we made the change down to Taranaki, um, purchase a, a small parcel of land and, and sort of work on our own our own family and, and our own connections to this, this world and, and what's important in it. Um,